Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. During the dot-com era in the late 1990s, there were four different venture-backed startups, well, actually six, depending on how you count, that focused on the pet retail space. Most famously, or notoriously, I guess, was Pets.com of the sock puppet fame, But today we're going to get some context and perspective on this moment in time from another player from this era. Joshua Newman was the founder of PetStore.com, which actually got started before Pets.com. Actually, it was probably the first of the pet retail players. But it eventually ended up getting acquired by Pets.com only about a year after it launched. I wanted to talk to Joshua because I think the PetStore.com story is a really interesting lens that we can use to look at the e-commerce companies in the dot-com era, the strategies that they pursued, and the really unbelievable environment that they existed in. So please enjoy this conversation with Joshua Newman of PetStore.com. Joshua Newman, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Uh, delighted to talk to you. Uh, let's let's just do a, a little bit of, of background. I know that you eventually got an MBA from Harvard, uh, but what, what did you originally go to college to study? Oh, gosh. I was a, a pre-med student uh, for a while, and then I switched to history, and then I wrote my own major uh, in European intellectual history, which is a combination of uh, history, literature, philosophy, and art history. Why did you switch to uh, getting an MBA? Well, it, uh, th- those things happened 10 years uh, apart. So mm-hmm. after I graduated with a, uh, with a BA, I went and worked in politics uh, in the California State Legislature and worked on uh educational policy and, and technology policy. Uh, and then uh, I got an MBA about uh, 10 years after graduating from college. So after after the MBA, you, you do uh, a little bit of management consulting for a while? Yeah, I worked for a Boston Consulting Group for a couple of years. Uh, learned a ton. Uh, just didn't fit with me. I was really much more of a uh, an operator, and what I've come to understand later is a, is an entrepreneur, and that's not a great match with management consulting. So I uh, I quit BCG after two years um, and cast about for about four or five months uh, uh, to find uh, my first startup, uh, and then join that company. And uh-huh. um, now I'm. Startup, startup number four right now, and that was my first one. I was actually employee number one. It wasn't a company that I founded. That was um, that was Amerigon? Uh-huh, which, which we took public uh, uh, on the NASDAQ. It's, uh, uh, it subsequently changed its name. It's called Gentherm, and uh, a multi-billion dollar market cap company, and they make uh, advanced automotive technology products. Uh, we were working way back when on electric vehicle technology, and then also on solid state heating and cooling technology. And some of your uh, listeners might actually uh, have had a chance to sit on that technology because uh, luxury cars use it to not only heat the car seats, but to cool car seats. And so if you're driving around in the hot sun and in a convertible and you've, uh, you've got a car seat that's cooled, uh, that's the technology that uh, that I originally um, helped get launched. 
That's interesting. And, and uh, so it, it is sort of a, a technology company. Um, so how do you go from there into the Internet game? I, I think you must leave Amerigon around the mid-90s, so the, the Internet's starting to really blow up. How do you, um, how do you get into the Internet game? Uh, at Amerigon, I was uh, in charge of raising capital, and, uh, and we raised a lot of capital from uh, private sources and then uh, from the public markets. Uh, and so I was contacted. Well, what happened is to the um, attorney that we worked with to take us public uh, had been contacted by a venture capitalist asking if the attorney knew of anybody uh, who could help uh, pull together a team and a business plan to start an online uh, pet store. And so he, uh, the attorney referred me to the VC, and that's how I got started. So this is around 96, 97? Uh, it, it's really uh, 97. 97. So um, just to lay a little groundwork here, I feel like um, – you know, with every round of of, of VC uh, generations, things like uh, uh, disrupting the the pet supply market always comes up. Sort of like uh, disrupting the 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 st- uh, student textbook market always comes up. Um, so, pets pet retailing is always this huge market. I think it was like thirty one billion dollars in in nineteen ninety seven. Um, and so, the idea was. Uh, you know, Amazon's already come out. E-toys, I think, it's come out around that point. So, the, what the VC wants to do is is go into this this pet vertical online. Uh, the the sequence there is is not uh, quite correct. Okay. So, so what was happening? Uh, what was happening is that uh, oh, we say Amazon's come out. So, Amazon came out with books. That's correct, but not in the pet space. So, Amazon had launched in the uh, in the book area. Uh, and and you're right that uh, eToys uh, had launched, uh, and then there was this uh, scramble to launch these other um, e-commerce sites in different verticals. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the um, uh, of the baby. There was a baby uh, mm-hmm. sort of a parenting site uh, that was quite big um, that was looking to sell baby products. Um, Drugstore.com. Uh, launched at that time, uh, and the conventional wisdom, this is all compressed into sort of months, you know, the conventional wisdom this month uh, was to look for um, high dollar per pound uh, products and uh, and pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, medicines kind of came out at the top of that list. Now, uh, it turned out that uh, pharmaceuticals um, had a lot of regulatory issues um, surrounding them, and so so they they had a high dollar per pound, uh, but you know a very high regulatory problem. The same thing existed with uh, with wine. There was an effort to uh, to do an online wine store, and there were big regulatory issues. And so so the VCs were looking at all the different retail uh, verticals, and uh, basically scrambling to fund teams uh, in each of those. Uh, the the pet vertical uh, was a large um, vertical, as as you mentioned. Uh, the retailers in it, uh, Petco and PetSmart, uh, were felt to be reasonably vulnerable uh, because they uh, had low market share. The 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 mom and pop uh, pet stores. Uh, we're really uh, accounting for the uh, vast majority of the total retail sales, and so the uh, the play was to um, really not have to go head to head with uh, with the major retailers, um, as you know, as Barnes and Noble in the book space and uh, and Borders in the book space, but rather uh, compete pretty effectively against the mom and pop companies and nibble away at the margin on the uh, on the big box uh, retailers. Is now there, the is there is there a sense among yeah. the VCs like 
you know, the 80s and 90s were all about ca- category killers. Like there's one or two big names in, in each category of retail. It, did the VCs feel that like that would play out in the same way online? Like there would be one or two big winners in pets, one or two big winners in, you know, I don't know what else, all these different e-commerce channels. Uh, well, y- yes, but but even more so. I mean, the feeling was that there was one winner uh, in each vertical. And um, because the, the way that you won was to be the first to IPO. Uh, and, and once you IPO'd, uh, you then raised you know, 50 or $100 million, which in, in 1999 dollars is, <laughs> you know, is a lot of money in today's dollars. Uh, you, you raise that money and then you've got really kind of the, the Uber you know, uh, victory, which is that you've got, you know, capital as a weapon. You're just, you know, um, can't be competed with because no one else, uh, in your category would have access to the capital. So there, there was definitely a race to be the one, uh, within each cat, uh, within each category. And, and the IPO was the, the, uh, was the key component of uh, that strategy. Rap. Oh, absolutely. Right. Okay. Go on. Sorry. Uh, and the IPO and the IPO market was, you know, extremely hot. Uh, uh, for these these companies that you know that had gone public, uh, eToys and the like, the um, the the problem, the perceived problem in the pet market was the you know the opposite of the of the um, of the drug market, which was you know very low dollar per pound of you know of stuff, and and so what uh, our kind of Secret sauce, if you will, uh, was twofold. Uh, first of all, first of all, one of the uh, people I recruited uh, was a Stanford Business School guy who, um, after Stanford, went and started his own uh, mom and pop pet store. And so he uh, he was a, a domain expert. Uh, and uh, we pulled um, cash register data uh, for a year in the store. And analyze the um, the weight uh, of each item that was sold and the margin of each item that was sold. Uh, and what we found out, which he knew himself, but what we documented with data uh, was that actually uh, the 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 dog food was really the loss leader, uh, and the money was being made off the the treats and the chews and the toys and the beds and things of that nature and that the you know, the average ring as they say the the amount of money that that uh, people would spend per uh, checkout uh, was on the order of, of $25 plus the dog food for a total ring of, of about $35 uh, and so the if we could solve the dog food problem of getting dog food to people as a um, both as a loss leader and as a hook uh, then there was a lot of margin to to be had uh, from these um, from these other products that people bought. Um, the other, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about how we solved the dog food problem in a second. Sure, but, sure. But the other thing that was attract, uh, attractive about the niche was that at that time there was a lot of focus on on the mix of of content and product, uh, and you really don't see that. Now in um, in the e-commerce areas, if you look at Amazon, uh, there's you know, basically no content about, um, uh, let's say, in the clothing area, you know, about the fashion industry or or trends or things of that nature, or in the in the baby area, content about how to raise a kid or how to keep them from getting a cold. But back in that era, there were uh, there were content websites that were getting uh, lots of visitorship. And so the, the focus was on how to marry content and commerce. And the, the pet area is very rich uh, in content. If you just look at YouTube and think about, you know, funny cat videos and, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, how to care, how to care for your sick dog and things like that. There's, there's uh, content that's attractive. So, so that was another plus for, uh, for the vertical. The, on the dog foods, uh, we uh, uh, analyzed the UPS uh, shipping network and the pricing system and determined that uh, 
that if with two warehouses strategically placed in the country, one would um, ha- would be in Las Vegas, and I forget where the other one is, was, but in the East Coast, uh, we could ground ship uh, dog food to 80% of the population uh, with uh, a two-day delivery time uh, because the ground shipment from UPS uh, could be quite quite fast if it's uh, within one or two uh, zones uh, and uh, and quite inexpensive. And so the uh, the we could uh, offer free shipping, which was roughly equivalent in price to the margin on dog food. So we could basically break even by uh, selling dog food uh, with free shipping and then uh, make money off these other sales that were quite robust in the brick and mortar world. So that that was the essence of the business plan uh, and really why we got funded. So you do the you do the analysis of the market, and and despite the cliche that it you, it's never cost effective to ship dog food because it's so heavy, um, it, you, you're convinced that 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 this is a profitable business. Um, you've already mentioned that like this is a really compressed period of time. So like, is it like a a twelve month, eighteen month um, sort of game plan that you have? We've got to staff up quickly. We've got to get the infrastructure in place, and then. Like you're you're visualizing an IPO within a year or eighteen months or things like that. Yeah, um, that, that's a that's a, a great question. The uh, let let me turn to that just after addressing the dog food. Okay, question. sure. Yeah. Uh, coinc- uh, coincidentally, uh, last night I went online uh, from Chewy.com and adjusted my subscription uh, delivery of a. Uh, 35 pound bag of dog food because uh, <laughs> I needed it a little a, a little bit earlier. So uh, there there are um, uh, lots of people, including me, who cost effectively uh, buy their dog food online on a on a subscription basis. Mm-hmm. Amazon sells it that way. Right, right. So it's uh, it is it is a cliche that you know like only it is uh, you know uh, ship dog food around, but but. Uh, I guess I'm an idiot for buying it that way, but uh, <laughs> it's, but it's actually quite, you know, quite cost effective. It's and been so, a pro- it's a uh, problem that's been solved. It's a problem that's been solved. All right. So in terms of the time compression, uh, we spent uh, about three months uh, pulling together our business plan uh, and uh, and getting funded, uh, and then uh, f- we had a, a launch plan of. Um, about uh, four months, you know, to open our doors in, in four months, uh, and then to ramp the business um, over, I don't remember exactly, but I guess um, over uh, 12 to 18 months, you know, up to some level that that was exciting. Uh, uh, two weeks after we got funded, uh, Amazon backed a competitor, Pets.com, with uh, uh, a about $20 million, if I recall, it might have been $40 million of funding. We, we had raised $10 million. Uh, and and that was a big, oh, shit moment, excuse my language, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, you, you think your your job is to, uh, you know, intelligently spend your $10 million bucks and, you know, get your uh, business up and running. And then you find out that you're competing against Amazon with uh, twice as much money. Um the uh, at that point we you know pulled ourselves together and said what are we going to do and we said well rather than open in four months we're going to open in four weeks uh, and so it was a total scramble and I'm talking about uh, finding seeing, uh, and outfitting and stocking a warehouse uh, building an e-commerce site uh, creating content and uh, a customer service operation and everything else. And so that that was a scramble. Uh, we did it in four weeks, uh, and it uh, it was just, I think every week uh, we were, well, let me see, every month we were probably doubling our, our staff, uh, and we doubled up to um, uh, oh, 70 people before we shut down.
so the the the, the, com, the compressed time period, the speed to launch, was always part of the plan because in this period, there's this article of faith of first mover advantage of get big fast. So you were always the plan was always to to go quickly uh, from the very beginning, right? Yes, there's a question of sort of what is quickly, you know, mm. and we went from sort of four months to four weeks uh, overnight. But and, and so four and months was fast. It, right. it gets compressed now because all of a sudden there are multiple competitors. I mean, there, so you guys are PetStore.com. You hear about Pets.com uh, getting going. But then uh, at some point in 99, the established players also come in uh, by investing in, in Petopia.com, PetSmart.com launches. So so all of a sudden, you guys thought that you were going to just race to be first, but now you're you're in like a four or five or six way race, right? Yeah, we're, we're in a dogfight, so to speak. Um, ab- absolutely. And uh, uh, and the, I think the total amount of funds that were raised uh, by the various competitors, you know, was uh, on the order of two hundred fifty million dollars. I mean, it was a you know, crazy uh, fight. Now, the the other thing to well, t- two things to say. One is that the technology was totally different back then. I mean, we were uh, we ordered servers from Dell, and they they showed up and were delivered with a forklift, all right, and brought to our office, all right, and um, uh, and the um, uh, the accounting system wasn't there. I mean, nowadays I could provision an e-commerce store. Um, uh, in 15 minutes with, you know, with for, the push of a button uh, with cloud and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but we had to build all that from scratch, you know, including at the hardware level, you know, we had to manage our own hardware. Uh, uh, so it, moving fast then, you know, was much harder than it was to move fast. Now, uh, the, the other thing I say is that the, the, the metric, uh, for, uh, and this is actually, uh, there's an analog today for this, but the, the metric for success was uh, customers, number of customers and, and revenue. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with profitability. And it's analogous to the, uh, you know, the number of, uh, you know, monthly users, um, monthly active users, you know, in, uh, in, you know, in the app world. And so everybody uh, was spending money as, as fast as they could, you know, sort of rationally attempt to spend it, not rationally spend it, but rationally attempt to spend it uh, in order to get their, uh, their customer acquisition up and, and success with um, uh, uh, um, shopping baskets that were actually purchased. And, and the, the race was to, be the leader in the customer acquisition and um, uh, and transactions. It had nothing to do with cost. Well, is there also um, you know a perceived leader like brand building because um, either even before anyone can be the first one to IPO, someone has to it has to be felt like somebody is the leader in this space. So, is all the advertising that that dot coms and and um, e-commerce players spent in, in say 99 it was it was all about not only branding but but coming out to that perceived lead in the market oh yeah a- absolutely and uh, uh, pets.com had uh, two advantages uh, one was that uh, they raised um, a lot more money than we did and then they had the Amazon Connection. The the other two players actually entered uh, much later. Uh, I'm talking about sort of you know two months later. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay, so the so, so pet pets that established a brand, um, and so the question is what well what was our strategic move? And so uh, what we did was um, look to sort of an analogous partner, um, Pets.com had Amazon as a partner. And so we uh, came up with the idea and sought out uh, uh, the Animal Planet uh, cable channel owned Discovery Communications, which was 
in terms of a brand in the in the pet space, you know, was really the most powerful brand out there. Uh, and, uh, and and in the context of uh, of a belief that content uh, was king uh, in this area, um, you know, they had the best content. So we we basically sold through a strategic sale uh, to uh, Discovery Communications and and retained. Uh, we continued to operate the company, but we were uh, majority owned by Discovery Communications. So the reason you do that deal is because you need the Halo connected to the the Animal Planet brand. Yeah, the, the yes, the, the the Halo that maybe you mean by the Halo is just sort of a um, you know kind of the uh, the perception of you know of uh, of being associated with them. It, it was much more than the perception. They were. Uh, as part of the deal, they were going to give us $20 million of free advertising. Uh, they had uh, content uh, that we would be uh, f- uh, featuring through our site. They had products that were proprietary. Uh, and then they had the uh, the brand, you know, the Animal Planet brand that, uh, I forget what the numbers were, but it was over 100 million people in the country, you know, actively watch that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was at a time, ta- that was at a time when, there weren't, you know, um, thousands of YouTube videos you could look at. I mean, people, you know, it was a very actively watched show. So I'm going to actually, I have some numbers here so we can set the context of this compressed time period. So um, Pets.com gets started in stealth mode in March of 99. You guys, PetStore.com, your website launches in May of 99. Around that same time, PetSmart.com gets going, May of 99. And then Petopia, which which Petco invested in, launches around, I believe, July of, of 1999. So <laughs> all of a sudden, all at the same time, there's this this dog fight, like like you've described it. Yeah, that's um, that Pets.com launch date is uh, is a little bit not misleading in an intentional sense, but there's a there's another story there, which is that. Uh, there was a uh, a fellow down in uh, Los Angeles who founded uh, uh, Idea Lab, Bill Gross, mm-hmm. who had the uh, who had um, I think brilliant idea of buying up the URLs um, across uh, the entire um, web space. So he owned you know Pets dot com and Beauty dot com and Cooking dot com and I mean, he he just bought, you know, a thousand uh, URLs because as, as you know, they're quite cheap to buy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and then he proceeded to sort of start um, kind of uh, bootleg um, uh, e-commerce operations in, in a bunch of these URLs uh, and with the intent of uh, selling them off to VC <laughs> to VCs who who wanted to launch uh, e-commerce verticals? So so that that March date was when Bill Gross uh, sort of launched um, not a fake store, but um, we we refer to this uh, as kind of a cereal. That if you want to test a product, mm. you um, like cereal, you you make a cereal box that actually doesn't have anything in it, and you put it on the shelf, and you see if anybody reaches for it it's like a like a placeholder yeah you don't have to make it's uh i guess in today's parlance it'd be an mvp a minimum you know viable product so it uh it was just a sort of test the water website and so they were up in march but but pets.com didn't acquire that site and get going until um um actually uh shortly after us i think they launched a three or so uh a relaunch three or four weeks after we launched. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious, uh, as you said, your original analysis of the market was that, that this could be a, a profitable business, especially if, if you get there first and have the first mover advantage. What happens to your model when all of a sudden you're facing four <laughs> competitors? Um, and like you said, it's something like 300 and $400 million of, of funding behind them collectively. Like, what does that what does that do to your strategy? 
Well, our our strategy then uh, became, you know, don't uh, don't try an IPO, but uh, make us uh, be acquired through a strategic acquisition from a major player. And so, it was a um, it was a, a save strategy. You know, it wasn't uh, it wasn't to reap the you know um, crazy rewards that. Uh, that the IPO market was reaping, but it was a it was a solid strategy. We sold the company to uh, Discovery Communications on a, a seventy million dollar valuation. Um, so you know, it was a, uh, quite a good sale in the sense of of that. Now it's these are seventy million dollar valuations that you know are totally illiquid, um, but uh, we felt it was a good save. Um. So Pets.com actually is successful in, in IPOing in, in February of, of 2000, um, but it actually it wasn't one of those uh, sort of, you know, it, it goes up 800% in, on its first day, um, and, and sort of, I, I think that that was, you know, an early signal that, like, the bubble was reaching popping stage because that was such a, a high-profile company to not get a pop on its first day. Um, was that was that a signal to you guys um, among the pets players that that uh, maybe maybe the the bubble was close to bursting? Uh, it was definitely a negative signal. Um, the it, it's it's really easy to you know look backwards in hindsight and say that oh yeah well the bubble is getting ready to burst, um, but no, people were not talking about the bubble bursting. People were sort of scratching their heads and, you know, wondering what to make of it. And, and the thinking was that, uh, uh, that they were successful and that the IPO performance was affected by the, uh, competition in the space, you know, the four players, uh, and that as they, uh, beat out some of these other players, then their uh, their valuation uh, would go up. Um, eventually, again, talk about things moving quickly. Um, you know, the the Nasdaq reaches its height in in March of two thousand, and then starts to descend. The bubble is bursting. Um, so rapidly, things turn around, and and at some point later in two thousand, Pets dot com actually acquires the assets of PetStore dot com from. Uh, discovery. Yeah. So the, uh, I, I, the 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 Nasdaq declining, you know, was not a, a a small decline. It was, you know, a very precipitous decline. Uh, and uh, and actually, before that, uh, Discovery Communications, uh, and I credit them with this, you know, had the foresight to feel that. You know that this uh, that the bubble was going to burst, uh, and so they uh, instructed us to uh, see if we could be sold to uh, Pets.com, which was public at the time. Uh, and so we were, uh, so we sold the company again. At, you know, two sales in the space of you know a few months. It was, um, when you say an asset purchase, uh, that it, these purchases are always asset purchases. You know, it it, uh, it was a purchase of the company. Uh, but uh, we were doing this in the uh, in the time frame of just a you know total meltdown in the in the market. Uh, when we um, uh, start talking with them, I think their stock was at uh, uh, fifteen dollars a share, roughly. When we came to an agreement on terms, their stock was seven dollars. When we um, signed. Uh, definitive agreements. Their stock was down at you know, four dollars. When we closed the final transaction, I think their stock was down at two dollars. And they shut their company down when uh, when their stock was at uh, I think twenty five cents. Uh, and um, and then they uh, uh, they did distribution. They didn't go bankrupt. They shut down you know, with cash in the bank and settled all their debts and. And the like, and, and distributed. I think two cents a share. Um, to to put some context in this, <laughs> uh, 
you know, I, I got a check for fifteen thousand mm. dollars, right? And it's at two cents a share, when you know everybody was thinking, including me, that this was going to be you know, twenty to forty dollars a share. So, uh, talk about you know feeling wealthy on paper. Mm-hmm. You know that was that was the environment for everybody. Well, and it's it's a wild ride. I mean, so you know, you're 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 launching a company in in early '99. You're ramping up. Um, within a year, you sell, and within a year after that, the Pets.com that that buys the assets goes under in November of 2000. So, like that's this whole story is in is in like 18 months. Oh yeah, and uh, two sales. Uh, well, raising money, opening a store, selling the company twice, uh, and then having the whole thing shut down. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, um, a wild ride, and the. And the tough part uh, for me uh, was that, and, and the upside on the on the uh, rising side of that curve, I mean, there was just huge excitement, you know, in in the entire um, San Francisco area. You know, everybody wanted to work there, uh, and uh, and we were, I mean, we had the classic, right? We had you know, pool table and foosball table and air hockey table and espresso machine. This was, you know, this is before right now that's the norm. I mean, but, you know, we were just inventing that, not, not only us, but, you know, part of this dot com phenomenon phenomenon, you know, we were inventing this, you know, new way of just, you know, having fun and lavishing perks on employees because it was you know, really hard to hire. Uh, at to, uh, one story about that, uh, we were hiring so quickly that we frankly lost track of who our employees were. And it, uh, <laughs> and at one point, uh, the human resources person walked around with a clipboard and asked everybody, you know, just went through the office and asked everybody, all right, what's your name? What are you doing? How much are you getting paid? You know, and had to write it all down <laughs> uh, to just, you know, make sure that, uh, that, you know, that, we, that our, Information systems actually, you know, were reflecting the people who were showing up, uh, and so you know that's how fast things were happening. And um, uh, and but when the you know when the when the bubble burst, you know, um, my job, you know, was to try and uh, pull a save out, you know, and uh, and sell the company, you know, to Pets.com. Uh, in really a fire sale, you know, situation, and uh, and I needed the company to stay operating uh, during that period. It wasn't just you know selling bags of dog food; it was selling an operating company with uh, with customers and uh, and the like. And uh, and also, and I went from sort of chief uh, booster, you know, uh, cheerleader, to kind of chief jailer. You know, I had to you know people didn't want to stay there, and I had to have really tough conversations with them about, uh, you know, about how, uh, you know, professionally that, you know, that it was their responsibility to stay. I'm talking about the executives, Mm -hmm. uh, that their, uh, that their stock options, you know, would depend upon them staying, uh, and their uh, references, you know, a good reference would depend upon them staying. And, and that was, first of all, no fun, uh, and, and a really tricky, uh, thing for me to to manage through, but we did it. Um, uh, lost some friends uh, along the way, unfortunately, uh, but uh, uh, but we held it together in time, you know, uh, long enough to sell it. Uh, but then, you know, for naught, <laughs> you know, the whole thing melted down after that. Yeah. Well, let's let's wrap up um, with with a, a, f- a couple questions about lessons learned from from this roller coaster, and the, and then we'll end with with what you're up to today. But um, my first question is, with the benefit of obviously 20 years of hindsight, um, was that was the big get big fast model the the um, you know first mover advantage uh, IPO at all costs was that flawed in the end because it really kind of only worked out for one player, Amazon. <laughs> Um, so w- w- was was everybody kind of chasing the the wrong strategy? 
Yeah, I don't think that's factually true that it only worked out for one player. I think drugstore.com uh, had a successful exit. They, they were bought by, you know, I'm, mm. I'm thinking back, there were, uh, there were uh, Baby Center, uh, whatever it's right, called. You're right, you're right about that. Uh, I, I, I apologize. There were several successful exits. I, I guess I was thinking in terms of a long-term company surviving, you know, 20 years, still with us t- today and things like that, um, which drugstore.com is, obviously. So uh, go on, sorry. Yeah, uh, so the... There's a reason to, to understand the uh, of a V is uh, driven that the returns in their portfolio are a uh, complete SUVA that they get. And so if you look at, um, you know, so some of these VCs have, you know, uh, IRRs of, you know, 40%, 50%. If you look at, um, that's not, you know, fifty uh, percent of their investments are returning seventy-five percent IRR, and the other fifty percent are returning a little bit. That's, you know, five percent are returning, you know, um, ten thousand percent, and you know, most of the others are failing. And so, uh, that the model from the VC side, I think, is uh, is is rational, which is. Uh, Get big fast uh, and look for the supernova because they, uh, they're an average. Uh, they expect the returns that they look for um, are exceptionally high occasionally. But the, but if you're the entrepreneur, uh, you have an undiversified bet, right? You don't get to make a hundred and have five of work out really well and the other 95 of them go south. You're making one bet. Uh, and so uh, get big fast, I think, is a good strategy for the, the VCs, but it may or may not be a good strategy for the entrepreneur. And and I think that really in your career. Uh, if you're early in your career, which uh, was the case for me, uh, uh, it it was a a good bet because I could fail uh, in a company, uh, provided I executed well, which which we did, uh, and learn a ton and go on and do other things. Um, but if you're late in your career, uh, which which I am now, uh, you know I, I started a company, uh, this company, when I was uh, 53. I I didn't want to make a a bet that had you know a very high beta with a high risk and high reward. I wanted something that, uh, uh, that stood a, you know, 80% chance of being successful, uh, but you know, with a much lower. And so that's, uh, that's my current software company to, uh, uh, to sort of be full through double, triple, uh, out of money, uh, because going to be in doubles, they're going to uh, only be interested in uh, because of their math. Uh, to just kind of briefly, I mean, if you raise uh, five million dollars uh, and sell a third of the company, mm-hmm. uh, you've got a company that's worth fifteen million dollars. Uh, that uh, that five million dollars is looking for a 10x return, which is, you know, uh, 50 million dollars. If they own a third of the company, uh, you have to have a 150 million dollar exit in order to get them their target return. So you raise five million, and now all of a sudden you have to have a plan that gets you to, to 150 million. Uh, and to have a plan that gets you to 150 million, five million is not going to do it. Five million is going to be the first try. And then you're going to have to raise more, and then you're going to need to have a plan that gets you to two to 250, and and pretty soon you've raised enough money so such that you're really only successful if you become a unicorn, and uh, and so that uh, that's the dynamic, and you, and that could be a good plan for you. It uh, it was not a good plan for me. Uh, right now I've uh, raised no profession. I've bootstrapped a company myself, and uh, and we're profitable. 
Uh, we're a, a SaaS uh, a data analytics company um, growing called, called Spotlight. organically and slowly. Called Spotlight, mm-hmm. growing organically and slowly. Uh, and uh, and I own 80% of the company. Uh, but we're not going to be a supernova. When you um, oh, this is the last question. Um, when you when you look at at unicorns now, like you know Uber, or Airbnb, Instacart, the um, do you do you feel feel the echoes of of the experience you had? Like, um, are, are are you are you looking and then thinking history is repeating itself, or or do you feel like it's a different environment? What do you what do you think of when you when you look at the unicorns today? Uh, repeating itself, but but in maybe a different way than you're uh, posing. The the thing that feels very familiar is the uh, is the the tone and the uh, and the feel of 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 the employment uh, situation in San Francisco in the Valley. It you know rents are the highest uh, uh, in the country. Uh, the competition for for staff is is crazy. The expectation of of employees uh, is you know off the charts. And in the sort of the part that you know the the hard hard work hard parting. Uh, uh, feel of it feels feels very similar on the uh, on the business side. I, I think that uh, there's it, a huge distinction between you know a company like Uber, which you know has a ton of revenue. I mean they, they've got a real business, right? I take Uber all the time. I, I think it's a great service. You know, that that's a very different model than. Uh, these freemium products uh, with large applications and not an obvious way to monetize it. That the foreign world, um, Snapchat, you know, for example, it's um, uh, feel, you know feels very familiar. But the uh, but the you know Uber and uh, and some of these other companies that that have this model are different. Uber up kind of crazy high, but uh, they have a huge yes. They're saying to just compare them, which is that the the cost of starting a company right now is just crazy small uh, compared to you know 20 years ago. And um, with the the open source software, the uh, Amazon Web Services cloud infrastructure, the ability to uh, contract with offshore teams. Um, the the, the um, software as a service um, modules that you could plug in, and so the uh, it's 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 really it, that's a very different environment. You know, you don't have to have servers delivered with a fork truck, a forklift, uh, and so the I think the lean startup uh, uh, is 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 a very different model that doesn't, uh, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Well, um, Joshua Newman, thank you for coming on the show um, and remembering all that for us and, and giving us the, the context of um, uh, comparing the, the, the two time periods in, in tech, uh, tech eras. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, And my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.